Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. Keep your relationship fueled up with strategies discovered by couples and experts. Because at Fuel Collective, we believe better relationships will equal a better world. You are about to discover specific insights and tools that cost little or nothing to implement to help you date forever. And now, here are your hosts, a couple who always have a half-packed suitcase and a date night in the calendar, Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. In today's episode, we're talking about the three questions to help you uncover your purpose, how to care for yourself and someone you love during times of change, the most magic word you can say to your special partner, and why suicide is never the answer. Now let's get into it. Welcome to the Date Forever podcast, everyone. This evening, we've got Graham Cowan, who is an author, speaker, who helps busy leaders build more caring and resilient teams who enjoy growing together. One of his proudest career achievements was helping to start Are You OK? And he remains an active board director. He became passionate about helping people to improve their mental health after going through a severe five-year episode of depression. In his earlier career, he worked in senior leadership positions with Johnson & Johnson, He's married to Karen and loves bushwalking near his home in Sydney. Welcome. Lovely to join you, Sammy and Nathan. We are very excited to have you here to have um, some pretty, I guess, pretty robust conversation. (laughs) That's good. So we opened in um, your intro a little bit about your involvement in Are You OK? Can you tell us how that came to be? Yeah, well, it really evolved out of personal experience. I was in, um, you know, I was working in the corporate sector and uh, there was a really uh, severe market correction and that led to me really crashing and burning. Like I, I've had, um, I'd had a number of episodes of depression before, but this was just on a whole different level. And uh, I lost my job. Um, my previous marriage broke down. Uh, I got... Um, you know, we had to live with my my parents. So it was a real George Costanza period. Uh, but, and then through that, it, it, I, I literally didn't work for five years. And, uh, but my path out was writing a book called Back from the Brink. And that was where I chronicled my own story, but also interviewed 12 other Australians, um, some well-known, some everyday Australians, just about their battle with uh, depression or bipolar. And, and then I wrote another book. And then through that, I met uh, Gavin Larkin, the original founder of Are You OK? in March 2009. And, um, you know, he told me about this idea and he wanted me to be an ambassador. And, you know, I just said, <laughs> it sounds like a great idea because I, I knew through my own experience that I wouldn't have made it without the support of, of my loved ones. and. Um, and so that's why I knew the concept was just so right. And, uh, and so I agreed to work furiously for the next nine months when there was only four of us to launch the first one in uh, 2009. And it's just magic to see how it's, um, you know, grown exponentially now. 83% of Australians are aware of it. Most workplaces celebrate in some capacity. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to see how that's all evolved. 83% of Australians, that's amazing. That's a, that's a, the, the impact of what you've worked on and created is that it's immeasurable. Yeah, well, you know, it, I, I think the, the great thing is it's always been a very, very small but committed team. And, uh, you know, the, the driving vision has been about a conversation could change a life. And that applies in so many domains, whether it's relationships or work or teams or community. And, um, and that was really, I think, part of Gavin's. He was originally a, uh, a CEO for an advertising agency and the brand was just brilliant with that tagline and it hasn't changed. And that shows you that it was spot on right from the start. Um, and even, you know, when Gavin passed away from cancer in 2011, of course, there were some hiccups, but it's just sort of gone on to be bigger and better. And I think that was the power of just really having, you know, a small committed group of people that buy into the, that, that, that purpose. Uh, that's, been, that's been wonderful. And you play a role now as a board member. Is that right? 
Yeah, and, and it's a pretty active role, particularly in the uh, workplace, because most of my paid work is in helping workplaces be more resilient and, uh, and enjoy growing together. Uh, and there's so much overlap, like so many times I've spoken with companies or company events, and then they've chosen to sponsor Are You OK or get involved in Are You OK in some capacity. So it's wonderful when, you know, those two things uh, dovetail together. You, um, you mentioned that um, one of your episodes or, I guess, timeframes around um, when you were experiencing depression was when you'd experienced kind of an economic crash and some things were going on in your workplace and in the environment. It's probably not dissimilar to what we're experiencing um, or what a lot of people would be experiencing as a result of COVID-19. Um, what, what do you wish you knew then that you now know? Or what are the, what are the similarities from that time in your life that, that there are? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very, I would say the change now is more profound. Um, you know, like, I don't think, like my father's 90 and he's never seen in his lifetime such profound change so quickly. So, uh, you know, the change now is bigger. So in answer to your question, I think back then, work, I had an unrealistic view of my association of my self-worth and work. And so when the work crashed, I crashed sort of thing. And I was quite driven. And I think the thing that I know now is that the most important thing in when you're going through these times is self-care. And that's, you know, taking time to exercise, taking time you know, for your partner or your, your spouse, for your good friends. Um, and, and also, when you're in that good shape, if you do keep yourself in a positive mood, you are, by definition, more creative, more resourceful, more positive, more energetic. And that really leads you to be in good shape to adapt to the changes. Because previously, in the last crash, I would say that I... Um, you know, I kept on doing the same stuff, but trying to do it harder and faster. And it was just like gradually running the fuel out of the tank. And when you run the fuel out of the tank, you lose capacity to really adapt and, um, and be nimble. And, and it's been, like I'm not saying it's been a piece of cake this time, um, but I, I guess I've just realised that you have to change things. And as an example, um, you know, most of my work was, live presentations at conferences and workshops. But very quickly, when, when they all cancelled for the entire year, I said, well, maybe that's not a good business model. And yeah. I had done webinars before, but I just very quickly, literally in three hours, put together a brochure about digital resilient solutions delivered globally. <laughs> and, uh, and so I just really thought, well, I had done webinars before, I can't do them again. And, um, and, it, and it has segued very quickly. And, and a couple of people with significant databases asked me to um, present, uh, which I did. And, you know, I did one literally with less than 24 hours notice, which was over to over a thousand people. And if I didn't have the... Um, if I hadn't done the 10,000 hours in terms of live presenting and some webinar work, I probably would have said, no, it's too soon, I can't do that. But, you know, I just said, well, let's have a shot. You know, let's give it a shot. And it went well. And straight away, it led to inquiries about paid webinars straight away. So, but it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't kept myself in good shape, hadn't practiced self-care, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's, um, you, you touched on it there, that, danger when our work becomes you know our sole identity and that when you know your, your work or your career or your business takes a hit that is unexpected how much that can impact your you know your sense of self and your sense of worth and you know that you're that financial figure that you bring home every week is somehow a measure of your contribution or your value to you know your partnership or your your household or you know your life which that's a big lesson to learn isn't it 
An incredibly important lesson. <laughs> I learned it the hard way. Um, but, you know, and, and I guess part of the um, moving out of that crisis was, I guess, realising the importance of doing meaningful work, work that was meaningful to me. And, um, and when you do have that mission, like this time when it happened, like, I, you know, I say my mission is to help future ready leaders build more caring and resilient teams who enjoy growing together. And so when, that, when the crisis happens, I said, well, has that mission changed? No, it hasn't. <laughs> but does it change how I deliver it? Yeah, it does. So let's, let's figure that out. And so there is something very powerful about having a strong sense of purpose. Do you have any tips or suggestions about how someone might go about that? If, you know, if someone's gone through a, a drastic change in their work or career as a result of COVID-19 and would kind of take, have the opportunity to take stock and kind of fork in the road moment, do you have any advice on how someone might be able to navigate finding that elusive purpose? Yeah, well, I, I usually do a three-hour workshop on it, so let me just summarise it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think it. one of the really, I'm not sure if you've heard of um, Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's the most remarkable book. It's, he was a Jewish... At Auschwitz, uh, right? Yeah. So he went through Auschwitz, um, lost everything, um, and made an observation about those that survived and those that didn't. And one of the th things that he saw about those that survived is they had a sense of purpose or a sense of meaning. And one of the things he says, and I think this is so true, is you don't create your purpose, you uncover it. And what he means by that is that it comes from our past life experiences. Like, you know, what were we passionate about as kids? What, um, what's an adversity that we overcame that we feel really positively about? What's something that we'd like to teach the world about? So I think they're really, really good background things to think about when you start uncovering your purpose. Now, when I do it in a work context, I think ideally it involves both, but most of my work with corporates is about in the work context. So what I say is to think about something in your work career that you're really proud of. You know, when you think about everything you've done, whether it was working McDonald's or this role or previous role, something that you're really proud of. And then I break people into two and I ask them to interview each other and they really dig into three questions. The first question is, what exactly were you doing? Who were you helping? And how were you helping them? And so one person interviews the other and it's generally for about five minutes. I tell them, you know, one, it's, not a, it's not a conversation. One person is just asking questions, digging, digging, digging. Then at the end of that five minutes, I have the person who's doing the interview paraphrase back what they learned. So I think, I think, you know, what you, why you named that the, your proudest moment was because of this and, you know, you help people in this and this. So it's a reflection thing. And I usually have people do a questionnaire beforehand, which digs into their past. And then I say, well, let's write the first draft of your purpose statement. And I stress that don't agonize about it. First draft progress is better than perfection. And so it usually produces, I help people do, or I help leaders do, or I help mothers do, or I help couples do. And you have to describe the benefits. So as I said, mine is, you know, I help busy leaders build more caring and resilient teams who enjoy growing together. Um, but, you know, I've worked with financial planners, for example, and financial planners went through all this bad press through rogue financial planners doing the wrong things. And they almost embarrassed to introduce themselves at, at parties. But mm -hmm. when I went through this exercise with them, a young guy said, I now know what I do. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, I help people be worry-free about money so they can live their ideal life. So he's not a financial planner. He, that's his purpose. So it's about delivering on that benefit. And when people, um, you know, it's their words. It has to be their words and it has to be their life experience and their uncovering. But that is an incredibly powerful thing to know and to have a first draft was. Now, they evolve. You know, they evolve. When I first came out of my depression, wrote my first book, my, my um, purpose was I help people overcome depression. <laughs> you know, it was that. But it's, it's now evolved to 
something that now really involves that, that personal experience with my background previously working in the corporate area and in the management consulting area. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, Graham, there was a time where maybe your purpose wasn't as strong. Um, late last year, I know that you shared your, your own suicide note on World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, I know a little bit about your story and that after you wrote that note, you did actually try and take uh, your life um, and that your parents found you unconscious and they called the ambulance. And obviously you're here with us, so that story has a happier ending. Um, can you take us back to that stage of your life? Yeah, it's sort of a bit like a, a bad dream, really. It's, it's almost surreal because, you know, my life is so good now and so fulfilling that it just doesn't seem possible. But it's the reason I shared it last year was that I wanted people to know that you could feel like that and then really, really bounce back. Um, but I was, I was unwell for, you know, five years and I just was 110% convinced it would never, ever turn around. And, you know, that's, that's why, that's what led to that decision. Now, it's really, um, and you have a funny mindset. You think that, um, you're doing your family a favour. Like, I really believe that. You know, I just saw myself being a burden to them for the rest of my my life. Um, I know now that that was just, you know, so wrong and it was insane thinking, but that's what happens when you uh, are in that sort of place. So it was a really uh, incredibly difficult time. Um, and I shared that note last year because I wanted people to know that no matter how bad you feel, you can you can come out of it. And it can also lead to, um, you know, quite profound changes and reflections that wouldn't have happened, quite frankly, if, if I hadn't been through that. And, you know, at the time it was, I would say it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. But... I now, now know that I wouldn't be having a life I did if I didn't go through that crisis. So it is the real classic crisis and opportunity story. Yeah. So, so I guess right now with the impacts of COVID-19 and our daily activities being like completely unrecognisable, I guess, from, from even a couple of months ago, um, like we've got couples working full time together from home and, and just everything, I guess, is, has been turned on its head. So I guess, what are some of the habits that you've learned along the way to to help people, I guess, adapt to adapt to these changing times and to avoid um, taking it all taking it all to heart and feeling like there is no way out? Yeah, you know, I um, one of the things that I can like I really thought a lot about how you manage your mood and maybe even master it. And I remember my psychiatrist once telling me that, you know, you should be able to learn how to manage your mood. And I said, well, haven't, haven't I got a mental illness? And he said, yes, you do. And you've had a predisposition to it. But there's things you can do to learn how to manage it. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about that, a lot of time researching it, and ended up coming up with um, what are the three critical elements of well-being. And quite frankly, it's the same whether it's normal times or crisis. There are some changes, but it's the same thing. And so there's three elements. There's vitality, which is our physical health. So that's, you know, enough exercise, good sleep, good nutrition. Yep. There's intimacy, which is our emotional health and well-being. So that's having good people in our life. That's our partner. It's, it's great friends. It's family. And, um, and then the third element is prosperity. And this is our contribution um, energy and this comes from our work especially if it's fulfilling work it can come from you know caring for a family it can come from uh, charity work or school work or uh, where you know you're making a contribution to the outside world and you know it's like three um, three glasses of water and when they're outside in the sun they're always evaporating and so I, I say to people, you have to act like a VIP, vitality, intimacy, prosperity. You have to keep on topping up each of those three glasses. And so what I really like to 
encourage people to do is to think about what am I going to do today for my physical health, my vitality? Yeah. Who's, who am I going to see today that is really good for me? And, and, I, I, and I really don't mean just your partner. Of course, that's a, an important part of it, but it's a big mistake to have it just your partner. You need to have more than that. And then the third element, you know, today, what is the one thing I could do which would have the most, which would make the most contribution? If I get just that done, that will be, that will make a difference. It will make a difference. And so that's what I really think about, that it, it's topping up each of those three areas. And I actually went on to create a self-care VIP snapshot where people just answer five questions in each of those categories to work out why, which is their emptiest glass. And that then hopefully it helps them identify what could be missing in their life right now and, um, and look at what you can put in place to address that. Where can our listeners check that or grab hold of that? Uh, we just go, so it's my website, so uh, you can probably include this in the show notes. It's grahamcowan.com.au forward slash self-care, one word. So that's where you'll find it. Awesome. So there's a couple of things that you touched on there about, um, you know, your partner not being the sole purpose, uh, person who's, you know, that you're getting your, I guess, your network um, and connection kind of cup filled from. Um, we're obviously spending, you know, for those of us who are now working from home full time and our partners may be working from home full time and we're, you know, in each other's company all the time. How do you sort of differentiate what is, you know, having a bit of a bad day adjusting to some of the changes versus, or actually I think that maybe there's something bigger going on here for my partner. I think sometimes we know we can observe um, things in our partner better than we can see them for ourselves. Yeah, I think that's very true. And I think even in this sort of lockdown type mode, it's so important to have perspective. And so, for example, both my wife and I get out every day, no matter what, we get out every day, sometimes together, but more often separately because we both are having very, very full days in terms of, you know, a schedule of Zoom calls and that sort of thing. And, and so together or separately, I think it is very important to get outside because things are different outside. You get inside a box, you think in a box, and you don't think creatively. Yeah. Um, in terms of looking out for each other, you know, it is, it is looking for changes in behaviours, changes that, that don't look typical, um, acting in a different way, more moodier than normal. And, uh, you know, there are unique circumstances which are really looking at that. So, you know, there's no doubt that we can play a huge role with our partner, but it's still testing, you know, it's still mm -hmm. like, because it's one thing, like I'm, I've worked at home for a long time, but, but having said that, I travel a lot during the week, you know, I mean, you know, on planes and what have you, or I'm in the city. So there's probably two or three days where I'm not at home. So suddenly I'm seven days <laughs> straight and so, and so is your partner. And, you know, you learn things that you never learned before. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think it is, you can look out, but I think it's also really important to encourage your partner to reach out to their good friends as well. And they could be mutual friends, but they might be just friends that one of those partners has. And I think that's really, really healthy. Mm. Um, you know, we've had, you know, my wife and I have had five Friday night drinks where I've been upstairs on my Zoom. She's been downstairs on her Zoom with her friends. And yep. because, believe it or not, we've got, we have, have a lot of time together right now. So that's, that's a good thing. And I think, and I can say this because this is what, was me before I had my breakdown. Men are really bad at this. Like for a lot of men, their social ties are at work. Um, and, and, and they'll often say this, that, you know, I've got to consult my social secretary. You know, it's the, the woman that often mm. does, uh, you know, the organising of the calendar and the organising of the things. But when things happen, like suddenly losing your job or what have you, it can be a massive crisis to... Uh, men and, and women as well. And I'm just going to talk about men because it's um, something I'm really passionate about because um, there's, I'm not sure if you've heard this term, but they, <laughs> you know, some women describe the men in their life as emotional gold diggers. And what they mean by that <laughs> is that 
they rely on the woman entirely for their emotional re relationship and discussion and therapy. And they'll, and they'll also refuse to go and see a therapist, by the way, as well. And so the woman just takes on all this burden, all this stuff. And, you know, if you Google emotional gold diggers, you'll see some very interesting articles around that. But since I came out of my um, breakdown, you know, I'm very deliberate about, you know, I have a list of, you know, probably seven guys, and it's usually guys in, in my world that, that I've really made an active effort to get close to. And so even in this crisis, I'm in contact with each of those people really, really regularly. Mm. And, and Cara, my wife, she has her own network. And, and that's really, really healthy. Yeah. So there are quite a number of organisations out there supporting people with depression, like including Are You OK? Um, but it can also, I think like you've touched on already, it can also take a massive toll on the people that are close to um, people with depression, um, especially their partners. So, so if your partner or someone close to you is dealing with depression, what are the, some, some of the things that we should be doing to actually help support them? Yeah, and I'd add, when I went through my depression, I wrote my first book, um, which was Back from the Brink, and it did really well. I had a lot of media and a lot of um, book signings, and so I had a lot of exposure to Talkback Radio. And the thing that really surprised me was that most of the people who called in were actually the loved ones. <laughs> they weren't yeah. actually the depressed people, so they were the loved ones. And, and some of a lot of women were pulling their hair out because their partner had an obvious problem but wasn't seeking help. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I learned firsthand about the toll it takes on the people around them. And when you're the one going through it, you often don't realise that. So to then specifically answer your question, um, in my third book, I surveyed 4,000 people to ask them what helped you best in bouncing back from your depression. And it forms an acronym, I care. And so I just looked at the themes. And so the I stands for identify, you know, how do you identify? And that's looking at changes in behaviour, changes in mood, changes in circumstances. Um, so that's a real red flag. The C is for compassion and asking, are you okay with empathy? Listening without judgement, asking questions, not trying to be a problem solver, but asking questions. The A is to help them access experts. Now, that may or may not include a uh, professional help, mental health professional. It could be just they need to get out, walk, um, <laughs> see a friend, see family. But it means accessing, accessing help. The R is for revitalising work. And work is really good for our well-being. And all the research shows that if we are going through a tough time, we are better off to be keep working, to stay connected with our colleagues if possible. It may mean cutting back on hours and workload, but we are work is actually good for our recovery. And then the E, the final part, is exercise. And, um, and so that's just the science from the Mayo Clinic tells you if you go for a 30-minute brisk walk, our mood is better two hours later, up to 12 hours later. Uh, and so... You know, I'm a real believer that our physical health and mental health aren't separate. They're so integrated. There's some things we need to take account of separately, but there's more that overlaps than is different. And, yeah. and for those people that want that, I've got a like a, a poster that describes that whole eye care framework. And again, that's just on my homepage of my um, website, grandcown.com.au. Awesome. Oh. Yeah, and I think that's a great tip for, for all of our listeners as well, like, if we can just encourage everybody to get out for a half an hour walk a day uh, with your partner, like especially if they are showing signs of depression or, or are not feeling the best in this time as well, we can get everyone out and... and get some yeah, steps in. Get some steps in, yeah. And, and uh, you know, I think when someone's quite um, in bad shape, they don't feel like exercising. And so you might even say, well, let's just let's get outside and have some fresh air. So just make it a little step. Let's get out to the letterbox. And once you're there, it's easy. Well, let's, let's walk up to the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then let's walk, walk to the cafe, get a coffee. Let's, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. So start little and then 
and just gradually build up, but it, but it is actually breaking that inertia and getting outside and, and moving the body. Yeah, I think that's a great tip, yeah, for everybody just to, you know, our, so much of our routine has potentially gone out the window and that's one thing that we can, you know, take control and take ownership and like, all right, I'm going to get that done each day, mm. move, move. So, Graham, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're amazing, I think, um, you know, to have had the life experience that you've had and then gone on to have such a ripple effect around you writing books, you know, speaking from stages, um, you know, creating, I guess, tools to help people move through some, some of the things that you've been through. Um, at Fuel Collective, we believe that um, we need to be the change and that, you know, really talks about being the change in our own lives but also being the change in the world and the world that we want to see. And for us, um, you know, part of being the change in the world that we want to see is having more of these conversations that we want to, um, you know, if our friends are not great, we want them to be able to talk about it. Um, so we really appreciate you you coming to have this conversation with us and, you know, and obviously with our listeners and hopefully that inspires other people to be the change and ask the questions um, and have the courageous conversations. Um, but to say thank you for being here, um, we, we want to um, honour you and, to do that, we're going to give um, nine days of business training to some women in Malawi, uh, which helps them establish their own business, um, create some financial literacy skills, um, which ultimately enables them to support their families and their communities as well. So thank you so much for making that possible. My pleasure. Thank you. So is there, is there one final tip um, for couples which you, you would recommend during this time? Yeah, well... There is. <laughs> um, two of the gurus I've really admired in this space is John and Julie Gottman. And they famously were able to observe a couple talking about something they disagreed with for 15 minutes and predict with 93% certainty would they be together in 10 years' time. So This is an amazing. incredible study that they did. Incredible yeah. study. And Julie Gottman was recently um, asked about what should couples do in this lockdown period? And she said, one of the big things is to remember to say thank you to each other. She's, they, I'm not sure if you know, but um, they categorise people into masters and disasters. <laughs> and, and, and my parents are masters. They've been married for, you know, 64 years and are still in great shape together. And what they say, the difference between the masters and the disasters is that the masters say thank you on average 12 times per day to their partner. So they notice the little things, they're grateful for the little things. And it's those little things that are so important in this, uh, you know, this, this massive turmoil. So that would be my final tip. Don't forget to acknowledge the tiniest thing that your partner does for you. Oh, and with that, thank you, Nathan, for joining me on the <laughs> podcast. Thank you too, Sammy. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Graham. <laughs> Pleasure. Love to join you guys. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app. Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.